Hello, this is a video based on a lecture that I gave yesterday to a group of people from the CPIM, the Communist Party of India Marxist. Uh, I was asked to give a talk on topics from Volume 3 of Capital and I chose the topic of the falling rate of profit with particular relevance to the rate of profit in Indian capitalism. Now when we're talking about the rate of profit we're talking about something in the world of finance capital and the world of finance capital is a misty world of illusions. It's not the real world. It's a world in which fetishes appear real. Marx is very explicit about this, that money is an illusional fetish brought about by the social relations of commodity production. The existence of things as commodities and the value relation between the products of labour which stamps them as commodities have absolutely no connection with their physical properties and with the material relations arising therefrom. There it is, a definite social relation between men that assumes in their eyes the fantastic form of a relation between things. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must have recourse to the mist-enveloped regions of the religious world. So Marx is explicitly saying that these monetary relations take on a mystical character in capitalist society. Semi-religious character. But behind this mist, there's something real. There are real people working. There are real machines being used. And there is a definite social relation between people corresponding to every economic ratio, like the rate of profit. And I'm going to go into what this social relation behind the rate of profit is. Not only the rate of profit, I'm going to look at the rate of surplus value and the organic composition of capital in that order before working up to the rate of profit. In order to concretize what is behind these monetary ratios. Now, let's take the rate of surplus value. Looking at this in terms of money, it is total property income, that is to say, profit in interest and rent divided by total wages. That's what Marx means by the rate of surplus value. But, as I say, this is still something at the level of f commodity fetishism. There is something behind that. What's behind it? Well, there are material products. There are the material products bought by wages, which are Marx calls necessities of life. Bread, shoes, clothes, etc. On the other hand, there are material products that are purchased out of profit, interest and rent. And these are luxuries and capital goods, which are or any capital goods that are accumulated. So, that's the material forms, but there's a problem with this. We're now attempting to divide a Mercedes with a loaf of bread, which mathematically doesn't make any sense, because these are incommensurable use values. So, if you shift from money to what the money represents, you get things which can no longer be compared and things for which a ratio is no longer possible. But what does it mean to say there's a social relation be behind it? It means that there are people behind it. It means that there are workers making necessities and there are workers making luxuries and capital goods. And the rate of surplus value is a division of the population. It divides the share of the population 
that are producing the necessities for the working class to live off on the one hand and on the other hand the part of the population that are producing luxuries and goods for the capitalist class. So this is a ratio between two parts of the workforce. It is a relation between people in this sense. Now once you've done that, once you have people on each side, it's sensible to do a division between them because you're dividing people by people and you can get a, a ratio like 120% is the rate of surplus value. But what this means is that for every 100 people producing necessities for the working class, there are 120 serving the capitalist class, producing goods which are either directly consumed by the capitalist class or form part of the accumulation. So this is now a sensible division. Having taken that example, let's move on to the organic composition of capital. Now, Marx says that's constant capital divided by variable capital. Now again, that's a money ratio. Millions of pounds in both cases. But when we look at it in terms of the social relation that exists behind it, we have, on the one hand, workers making necessities this year. On the other hand, a stock of means of production. Dead labour embodied in means of production. And how do you measure that? Well, it's the number of person years that was spent in the past building up the current stock of plant and equipment. So we have a ratio here between person years in the past and number of people working today. OK, this is unchanged. This is what we had in the rate of surplus value. On the other side now, we are talking about labour in the past, not the current labour, not the current division of the population. Now let's look at the rate of profit. We've seen each component here before. So we have the workers making luxuries and capital goods today. And the other side, you're dividing that quantity by a stock, which is a stock of capital goods, stock of elements of constant capital. And this is measured in the person years spent in the past building that plant. So we have a ratio between people and person years. But it's in the opposite direction to the organic composition of capital. In the organic composition of capital, the people are at the bottom. Here the people are at the top of the division sign. Now, what are the dimensions of these numbers? Well, the rate of surplus value, because it's workers divided by workers, the ratio of workers doing one kind of thing to workers doing another kind of thing, it is a dimensionless number. On the other hand, the organic composition of capital has dimension time. This is not obvious, but when you think of it, it is worker years divided by workers. The workers cancel out, so you just have the years. So its dimension is time. The rate of profit, on the other hand, has dimension time to the minus one, since it's workers divided by worker years. And that is why the rate of profit is expressed as something like 10% per year. It's always per year. It is a ratio per year. Its dimension is time to the minus one. Now this has implications. Now what are the connections between them? The profit rate varies positively 
with the rate of surplus value. If the rate of surplus value is high, we get a high rate of profit. And it's important to note that because the rate of surplus value is a pure number, it can change quickly. It can change almost instantaneously if wage rates change. That's because it's a pure number. The organic composition of capital, on the other hand, has dimension time. And it therefore takes time to change. It takes years to change the organic composition of capital in a country as the capital stock is slowly built up. Now this has important implications for the dynamics of capitalism. And on the other hand, the rate of profit, according to Marx, varies inversely with the organic composition of capital. High organic composition of capital leads to a low rate of profit. Now let's apply all this to India. And for this, I'm using Marchetti's extended pen world tables version 7, which came out in 2021. And I have extracted the rows of the pen world table covering India from 1950 to 2019. Now, the dots indicate the rate of surplus value. The lower bluey curve is a gross profit rate. The upper curve, bluey curve, is C over V, the organic composition of capital. Now, we can see this is divided into three distinct historical periods. In the period up to 1980, when there was considerable state direction of the economy in India, you had a rising organic composition of capital. Top line is rising up until 1980 in period one. As a result, the rate of profit falls. But note, the rate of profit also falls because the rate of surplus value tended to fall over that time. Now remember what I said about the rate of surplus value being a dimensionless number. It can therefore change instantaneously. There is a lot of high frequency noise in the rate of surplus value. It fluctuates considerably over time. On the other hand, the rate of profit is affected by both the slow trend of the organic composition of capital and the rapid trend of the rate of surplus value. So when there is there are falls in real wages as in 1970 or 1969 you can get a big increase in the rate of surplus value and a decline in the organic composition of capital. Sorry, a rise in the rate of profit. The, rate, the organic composition of capital, on the other hand, changes very slowly. The next thing to sit notice is that there is a second period from 1980 to 2000 when the organic composition of capital was stable. This corresponds to the start of the neoliberal period in India. The organic composition of capital was stable, the rate of exploitation was rising, so the rate of profit rose. And the final period, we start seeing a rising trend of the organic composition of capital again. That is the last 20 years. It start, it's started to rise again in India, and the rate of surplus value has fallen slightly. Again, it oscillates, but the trend has been downwards. And as a result, the rate of profit has declined again. It hasn't declined as much as it declined 
in the first period, but it has started to decline. Now, what are the underlying causes of this? Well, the basic underlying cause is variations in the rate of accumulation. The red line now indicates the rate of accumulation, okay? Accumulation as a share of profit. And it is rising during the Dirigis period or stays high during the Dirigis period. Actually, more than 100% of profit is being accumulated. How can that happen? It's because the capitalist class was not the only source of accumulation. The Indian state was also accumulating. Accumulation was therefore partly met out of taxation. This allowed the accumulation to be greater than the level of profit. And this is what drove the rate of profit down, the high rate of accumulation. When you had neoliberalism in introduced, immediately the rate of accumulation started to decline. The state accumulated less and the capitalist class consumed more of what of the profits they had. The subsequent start, uh, fall you started to get in the rate of profit is when the rate of accumulation rose again. So that's the driving factor. Now why is accumulation so important? A high rate of accumulation raises the organic composition of capital, which lowers the rate of profit. It also, as a secondary effect, increases demand for labour power. And as a result, workers are able to win higher wages, and that further reduces the rate of profit. Those two factors combined during the Dirigis period to drive down the rate of profit. And this wasn't just true just in India. You see it in many capitalist countries between 1950 and 1970. High rates of accumulation, declining, um, well, rising real wages, and a declining rate of profit. What about population? Because India was a country of rapidly growing population. A rapid growth of the workforce also has two effects. Firstly, it increases competition among workers. And this tends to hold down wages and increase the rate of surplus value, therefore increasing the rate of profit. And secondly, if the workforce grows more rapidly than the rate of growth of the capital stock of the country, then the organic composition of capital will fall and this will raise profit rates. Now, India didn't actually get to the state of the organic composition of capital fa falling, but the growth of the population between 1980 and 2000 was sufficient to exactly balance the rate of accumulation so that there was the capital stock and the working class were growing at the same rate and there was therefore no rise in the organic composition of capital. The next thing to consider is technology. How does technical change and the rise in the productivity of labour produced by technology affect all this? Well, in Volume 1 of Capital, Marx explains that Improved labour productivity increases the rate of surplus value and it does so because it reduces the number of workers required to produce the necess necessaries of life. As Indian farming partially mechanised, the number of workers required to be working in agriculture to feed each worker in industry declined and this allows a rise in the, the, uh, the rate of surplus value. Secondary effect is that technical change 
depreciates the capital stock. It depreciates it in what Marx called moral depreciation. The machinery may still work, but because it could now be made more cheaply, its resale value has declined. If a capitalist closes his factory and tries to sell off the 10-year-old machinery, he won't get as much as he would otherwise expect because technical change has meant that equivalent machinery of the same productivity is now cheaper or for the same money you could obtain machinery of greater productivity. And therefore, the faster the rate of technical change, the more rapid the moral depreciation of the capital stock and therefore the organic composition C over V, which according to Marx always has to be calculated in terms of the current replacement cost of capital, declines or its growth slows down anyway. And ordinary depreciation also tends to raise the net rate of profit. Sorry, the gross rate of profit. Because the gross rate of profit includes depreciation. Depreciation, therefore, has to have a constant, a, a, sorry, a positive correlation with the gross rate of profit. Now let's combine all these effects. We know accumulation lowers the rate of profit. Technical change raises it. Population growth raises it. Depreciation raises it. The gross rate of profit. Now, can we combine all of these into a single formula? Yes, you can. This is the formula. Our star, by which I mean the attractor for the rate of profit, the dynamic attractor, the thing that drives it dynamically, is determined by G, the rate of growth of the workforce, plus D, the rate of depreciation, plus T, the rate of technical change. That is to say, the percentage improvement in labour productivity each year. So G plus D plus T then has to be divided by R, which is the share of profit being accumulated, because we know that accumulation tends to lower the rate of profit. Therefore, the rate of profit must be inversely related to the rate of accumulation. And if we, as I explained to the comrades yesterday, the, this equation was originally published in this article, Demography and the Falling Rate of Profit, uh, in the Indian Development Review. Let's look at its effects in India. Well, if we plot that formula that I just gave you, the R star formula, and I've taken a, a four year moving average, we see that it fluctuates and the fluctuations correlate very closely, both in the long term and in the short term with the actual rate of profit which is the blue line. So this shows that if you start off from the arguments in Marx's Capital about technical change, about the effects of accumulation, about the rate of growth of the workforce and de depreciation, you can easily combine these into a single formula which predicts or explains the dynamic movement of the rate of profit. There is, I haven't bothered to calculate the correlation between these, but it's clearly a very high correlation. So this is, a, in, a, in a sense, a validation of the basic analysis that Marx presents 
in Capital Volume 3 and also Capital Volume 1 of the rate of profit and the determinants of the rate of profit. Combining them, all the things he says, into one formula, you see it explains what's happened in India for the last how many years? 70 years. Okay, that's the end.